I surely feel that I need a moment after that. I am so thankful for this series that's being done, the pillars of our faith. And I pray for the effect of changing us as a people and then many others through us. Greetings to you again in the name of Jesus. It's good to be here tonight. It has been established that sin began with a bright and gifted angel, one who stood close to the very throne of God. His name was Lucifer, a compound word that means light bearer. And over the centuries, He became the purveyor of darkness and death and destruction and hatred and bitterness and hopelessness and everything else that makes life miserable down here. Lucifer designed a coup. What he hoped to do was unseat God and become the leader of the cosmic government. This was his purpose. He accused God of being arbitrary, of being selfish. He said that God could not be love as he claimed to be and at the same time be just. And if he were just, then he could not be love. Lucifer attacked the law of God. He said it was harsh and unreasonable, God requiring obedience, and the penalty for disobedience would be death. And oh, how he made hay with that one. Remember, Lucifer had been a covering cherub, and one writer has said, He was so close to the very presence of God, he appeared to be lighted with divinity. Here an angel with great and marvelous privilege and potential in a perfect place, a place of glory and peace. In a prophetic overview, John the Revelator wrote, there was war in heaven. Michael fought, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Now, out of pause while you say amen. Amen. He fought, but he lost. And I want to come to that again before we are finished here tonight. He fought and prevailed not. Not only that, but he was expelled from heaven. No more could he have access to appear before the throne of God. He and his angels were cast out into the earth. God had already created the earth. You know the power of that story where there was nothing. God said, let there be something. And there was light. And all the other things were created for the good of man, for his comfort, for his sustenance. But God had also warned man about the fall of Lucifer and what he might try to do. And man was aware that an enemy was abroad in the land. Adam and Eve at the time were perfect. We can use that word rather easily, but need to think about it. They were perfect. But Satan is called the arch deceiver, premier, number one. There's nobody like him in the universe. And so on an occasion, channeling himself through a serpent, he encountered Eve. Hath not God said that you shouldn't eat of the trees of the garden? 
And Eve was quick to come to God's defense. No, he didn't say that. He said, of all the trees, we may freely eat except one. Aha, said the devil. That's the one. That's the one that will make you like him. That's the one that will give you the biggest thrills. That's the one that will open your eyes. And you will understand things that only God can understand. But Eve said, God has warned us, the day we eat thereof, we shall surely die. And Satan responded, ye shall not surely die. The first recorded lie, ye shall not surely. Actually, it's a kind of double talk. You're going to die, but not surely. And most people on earth today believe that dead folk are dead, but not surely. That's why they wouldn't walk through a graveyard at midnight. <laughs> and some of the laughter I hear is saying to me that some of you wouldn't do it either. <laughs> the Bible says Eve saw the fruit that it was pleasant to the eye and the taste. Now, if she tasted it, she's gone too far. Now, if you stop with pleasant to the eyes, it's important to understand that all the trees in God's garden were pleasant to the eyes. No excuse for Eve doing what she did. And she ate of it and gave it to her husband, and he ate of it, and heaven was thrown into shock. Trauma reached the very throne room of God. Sin had invaded the Garden of Eden, and had come into the lives of the human family. And in the cool of the evening, along came God. You may do as you like. You may disobey if you want to, but sooner or later, along comes God. And Adam and Eve were hiding from him, but God came seeking them. There was something that needed to be done. You cannot take wrong and make it right and vice versa. But God had another plan. First of all, they were driven from the garden lest they partake of the tree of life and become immortal sinners. I read this somewhere. I, I couldn't find the reference, but it says, God and man belong together. And the universe will not know perfect bliss until God and man are reunited. Therefore, I marvel at the patience of God over these thousands of years. But something else dreadful took place that day. Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities have hidden the face of God from you. They have separated you from God. We all know that man in his present condition cannot look on the face of God and live. Cannot. So in mercy, God had to withdraw from his creatures. But God appeared desperate to communicate with man. No longer face to face as he did with Adam and Eve. But he wants to communicate with man. There are things that man needs to know. Man needs to know in his guilt and his shame that there is something in God's plan called salvation. Man needs to know of repentance and restoration. He needs to know about immortality. He needs to know about a coming Messiah, one who is as God becoming flesh and going to a cross to die for, for what Adam and Eve had just done. He needed to know all of that. To be honest with you, he needed to know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son because Christ was given before the foundations of the earth were laid. Adam needed to know. In the book of Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, we read that God would do nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. 
I picture it this way in my imagination. There is a golden line that runs from Adam and Eve in Eden all the way down to the very end of the world. And God has placed true prophets all along the way, giving to human beings the gift of prophecy. And one of the evidences that it is coming straight from God, it always agrees with the Bible, it always happens as God said, and usually it happens right on time. Here is a gift of love given to an unlovely group of people. How long shall it be amongst us? The Bible says, till we all come into the unity of the faith. Now, there is an imagined problem here. God, in communicating, can only use the truth. But the devil can take truth, mix it with error, create a concoction to deceive. God cannot do that. Whatever he says is always the truth. So as God placed prophets along the way, the devil caused false prophets to proliferate. Their purpose to thwart God's truth, to alter it, to rest it, to confuse it, to turn it against itself, to make right seem wrong and wrong seem right. And out of this comes a malaise of confusion. And the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. In Ezekiel 22, you read of some of these false prophets. The Bible says they put no difference between the holy and the profane, nor any difference between the clean and the unclean. False prophets are always available. They love to dispute truth. They love to argue. They love to get angry over the Word of God. They are desperate people to embarrass heaven. But a true prophet always agrees with the Bible. Amen. He has no problem. I remember the first evangelistic campaign I ever conducted was in a small town. And one day after preaching a week or two, in those days we had long meetings, someone came to me and said, you ought to know that at such and such a place there is a learned pastor and he spends his time refuting what you are teaching. I, I smiled at that. He said, wait a minute, doesn't that frighten you a little? I said, not really. He said, why doesn't it frighten you? I said, because I don't have to make mine up. <laughs> and if you tell people what God said, you are telling them the truth. Amen? Amen. So there was no need to worry about that sort of thing at all. Now, God, in mercy, could not contend for the truth in person. We've already established that. His presence would destroy those who wanted to hear. Right. So walk with me down the centuries. Uh, we can't touch everybody, but I'd like to begin with Enoch. The Bible says he was the seventh from Adam, and he prophesied concerning the second coming of Christ. Way back there. The message is consistent. It does not change. And then later on, God sent Noah. And Noah had an awesome prophecy. 120 years, and there will come a flood. And the people crowded around. What's a flood? Rain is going to come down and drown all of the enemies of God. What's rain? Now remember, it had never rained before. And when the word got out concerning the prophecies of Noah, the false prophets had a field day. I can imagine them saying, that dim-wit old man has sold all of his holdings, which were considerable. He sold his place, and every dime he got was put into wood and tar for making an ark. Can you imagine a great big boat being built on dry land? Not only that, but on a hill to boot. And they laughed and they mocked and they carried on. 
The Bible tells us something about those days. The morals of the people were totally corrupt. Every imagination was perverse. Corruption was everywhere normalized. Truth was marginalized. This is the way it was. There was no way, therefore, for them to understand how disgusting sin is to God. God came to the point he repented he had made man in the first place. At the same time, he told his prophet to prepare an ark, an ark of salvation. Noah just kept on preaching. When it was all over, only about eight people made it. There were eight, as a matter of fact. They were on the ark, but actually there were more. Many of them had worked on it. Chief amongst them was Methuselah, who died just before the flood came. But remember, it had never rained before. And the intellectuals amongst the people laughed at the notion. They spent time reveling near the ark. And one day... They saw something they had never seen before. They saw a animals coming. And in an orderly manner, a parade right down Main Street. And they were headed straight to the ark. Now, I have said this before. But it seems to me, if I had been amongst the unbelievers, it seems to me, that if I saw two lions walking behind seven sheep, <laughs> and two wolves marching behind cattle, it seems to me it would have made an impression, but you can go too far. Ellen White says, through repeated transgression, you can come to the place where you cannot see. You, you, it's dangerous to keep knocking what God has declared. Dangerous to come to the place all you know to do is fight against the spirit of prophecy. That's dangerous. You come to the place where you cannot see. And then after Noah was shut up in that ark for a while and it seemed nothing was going to happen they resume their mocking and their picnicking near the ark to laugh at the old man shut up in a thing with only one window and no AC. <laughs> but one day they looked and saw something else. Dark clouds began to march across the horizon and confederate. Lightning flashed the threat of God's vengeance. They'd never seen this either. And all of a sudden, they heard it coming from the distance like dried peas on a summer threshing floor, the advancing columns of rain. And the spiritual says, didn't it rain, children? Rained all night long, 40 days without stopping. Didn't it rain? Now let's look at another by the name of Moses, a great prophet. He and God were so close they communed face to face, meaning God was veiled, but he was able to talk to Moses one on one. That's right. And Moses wanted a privilege. He asked God to allow him to see him. And God said, no, if you look at me, you cannot live. So I'm going to hide you in the cliff of the rock and pass by and you will see the back of me. The afterglory, one writer said. After God has safely moved out of range, there was an effulgence that remained. And that's what Moses saw. But I want to tell you that what he heard was worth more than what he saw. For he heard God describe his own character. I am God showing mercy. I am God forgiving sins. I am God who is compassionate, and yet I will not clear the guilty. And Moses wrote that down. If he had only seen something, it would have been for him. But this is written down for you and for me. 
the character of God. Oh, praise his name. Amen. I love to hear myself say, God never lies. Amen. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it's impossible for the God to lie. The Bible says that the devil is a liar and the father of it. And so we've got that straight, haven't we? But I'm also convinced that some people enjoy being lied to. Otherwise, how could false prophets prosper as they seem to do? Some people enjoy being lied to. Now, I have a sympathetic heart. You lose a loved one, but you cannot comfort me if I lose one by telling me a lie. You cannot comfort me by telling me my loved one has shot right straight off to heaven. If that happened, then all of us ought to go out of here and try to get killed tonight. <laughs> it would be a lot better being in heaven than even being here at 3 ABA. But ladies and gentlemen, false prophets have proliferated throughout the entire world, and they have a battery of lies. And people eat it up and pay for it out of their weekly checks. One of the lies is that God is too good to destroy this world. My answer is he's too good not to. Something's got to put an end to this mess, and Jesus is going to make that kind of adjustment when he comes. Another lie is that God doesn't care how you worship. What kind of slipshod God is that? And then they add, he doesn't care which day you worship him on. The law is done away with. May I stop to tell you, true prophets have never been very popular. Did you hear what I said? And if you're running a popularity contest and you are the entrant, you're in bad shape. True prophets have never been very popular. False prophets had the run of the palace in the days of Ahab and Jezebel. They lounged wearing semi-royal robes. They ate food paid for by the taxpayers, the false prophets. But there was one true prophet. Was he at the palace? No. He was out in the wilderness running and hiding, trying to stay alive. God had to send him food to eat by ravens. False prophets are popular. True prophets seemingly never are. Then we speak of the major prophets. Isaiah, the gospel prophet. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Weeping at the destruction of his beloved temple and the city of Jerusalem. And after him, there was Ezekiel, with his clarion call to repentance. He wanted the people to know that if you will turn, God will forgive. That's right. But they ignored him. And then there was Daniel who was shown the span of years all the way down to the end of the world. But most importantly, to the coming of Messiah and the offering of himself in the midst of the weak. Daniel actually told the people when to expect the Lord to come. That's right. Then they talk about minor prophets. These were regional prophets. They had special messages for special occasions and special groups of people from Hosea to Malachi. There were certain explosive truths that God revealed to his servants. They were written down to blast sophistry falsehoods, false gods, and false worship, and at the same time to sustain God's true people. This was what the prophets 
did. Now, no true prophet, it seems, did any writing between the 400 silent years of the two testaments, old and new. All of that time, and no worthy prophet. Chapter after chapter in the Old Testament, the Bible says Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. What's wrong with us? And so here comes this long period when God didn't honor them with a true prophet. When Jesus came later, he said, you kill the prophets, the true ones. You hated them. You disliked them. But during that 400-year period, tradition rose to the top. For 400 years, they were taught by learned men in sacerdotal robes and glittering jewels. They made such an impression that Israel was fractured and split off in many directions. For all that time, and tradition was exalted above truth. Tradition became more important than the truth of God and created, even for those who didn't want to go along with it, a burden of confusion with man-made extraneous nonsense proclaimed from desks like this in synagogues everywhere. Nonsense. Tradition. God's plan and God's will were set in caricature, and people thought little of God. Men were dying, facing eternity without hope, and listening to foolishness where truth was supposed to be proclaimed. Amen. In the fullness of time, Jesus was born. Amen. They were not ready to receive him at all. Why? Because the prophets had warned them. The prophets had told them that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. Micah even told them the town he would be born in. The little town of Bethlehem. Now, you know how we humans think. I thought to myself, if, if, if God is going to stick his neck out and name a town, then it seems to me that he would go to that town to find a virgin. Now, I, I cannot believe there were no virgins in Bethlehem. <laughs> I'll tell you what, there was a jealous king who would order little ones slain. God knew what he was doing. He kept Mary up there near Nazareth. Now, I was over there and I said, how far is it from here to Bethlehem? And my interpreter said, roughly 75 miles as the crow flies. Okay, after six months, move her down there. No. Seven months, no. Eight months, no. She was great with child when her husband decided, under the instruction of God, to head down to Bethlehem. Now, what man in his right mind would take his wife, expecting a baby at any time, 75 miles on a donkey. Well, he had to travel slowly. Others passed him by. When he got there, there was no room in the inn, but away in a manger, no crib for his bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head in Bethlehem. Would you say amen, I said? Amen. It had to come to pass, or there would be, there would be in Scripture a falsehood. One day a rough and ready preacher emerged from the desert where he had been educated. His name was John. And when he had broken in on the scene, he attracted great masses of people, including prophets and priests who came out to see the spectacle. A true prophet. A man who didn't sound like the others. A man who didn't dress like the others, a man who didn't eat like the others. Are you getting it? And finally, let me say, one who didn't preach like all the others. But it was clear to everybody who came within earshot that the power of God rested upon him 
to such an extent that the people crowded around after service to ask questions. Are you the Messiah? No. Are you Elijah risen from the dead? No. Then who in the world are you? I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Not only that, but this humble man said, one comes after me whose shoes I am not worthy to unlatch. And then one day, as he was surveying the crowd, he saw someone coming, recognized him immediately, and he cried out, Behold. You ever stop with words like that? What do you mean, behold? It means, hey, look. Everybody, look. Behold, here he comes, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That was John. And the Lord said, there was never a greater prophet than John. I, I wanted to throw that in right there because some people think that the only true prophets are those who have books of the Bible named after them. There is no book called John the Baptist. And there are some others I could name right now. Oh, my friends, we must accept God's Word from God's people. No matter what happens to us, John ended his career with his head chopped off and placed on a platter and delivered to a voluptuous adulteress. But Jesus said there was never a greater prophet than this one. Prophets had told about Christ, about the place of his birth. They also told about his arrest, the torture he would endure, the whipping that would come from strong men with their cats of nine tails, and even his crying, I thirst. Where that is written, the Bible says that the Scripture might be fulfilled. He cried, I thirst. And when they offered him the wrong thing, he simply turned away, dropped his head in the hollow of his own shoulder, and died. Jesus, the Son of God. The devil hastily called a conference with his demons and all those humans who cooperated with them. They got to do one thing. They got to do one thing. At all costs, they've got to do one thing. They've got to keep him in the tomb at least four days. Why four? Because he had said, after the third, I'm going to rise. Oh, I, I love a God you can count on. Even the true God in death could be count on, counted on, for divinity never dies. Would you say amen out there? As a matter of fact, Jesus said, I lay down my life, and I take it up. Nobody takes it from me. But all of them were conspiring to keep Christ in the tomb. But on Sunday morning, the earth quivered and shook. What's going on? An angel had touched down. That angel rolled the stone away. And Jesus walked out of there. The great king of the universe had wrested a hard-fought victory over death and hell. I've been to both spots, the traditional one over which they built a church, and the one Elder HMS Richards told me is the one. I've been to both. We even did television at that one. And I remember the first day I walked in, and I was so amazed to look around at a roughly hewn tomb. And the man in charge said, if you've come here seeking Jesus, he is not here. He has risen. I turned and nearly jumped up in the air. I said, man, that's what I believe. That's what I believe with all my heart. Christ spent 40 days with his beloved church, told them to wait on the Holy Spirit, then go out to preach the gospel in all the world. And the message that is preached in truth to the worldly wicked is boring. That message to the immoral is threatening. That message to the power hungry is irrelevant. That message to revelers is foolishness. But let me tell you, to honest souls seeking a Savior, it is hope to those who are insatiably thirsty. 
It is the water of life to those who are starving for spiritual bread. It is the bread of life to lost men everywhere. It is salvation. And to those who are bound in sin and can't seem to ever break loose, the message that God delivers through his prophets is a message of freedom. God can set you free. Now, he had told his disciples, I'm going to go away and I'll come again. Ellen White says they wanted him to come quickly. They, they really did. And by the way, people still say, my Lord delayeth his coming. And one day I wanted to deal with that and I read from the Lord's servant. She said, there never was a time that that message should not have been presented with urgency. So we are correct in making the message urgent. The business of when he will come is up to him. But Paul wrote a letter to the church at Thessalonica, and he said, let no man deceive you. That day will not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And when Paul wrote those words to the church, whether he intended to do so or not, he was predicting the dark ages, a 1260-year period when men would refute the true prophets altogether, a time when tradition would come in and replace truth, a time when rank and raw paganism would be baptized in the church, a time when the saints of God would yield their lives as martyrs for the truth. By the millions, by the millions. And so John wrote, try the spirits, whether they be of God. Why should we do that? Because many false prophets are going out into the world. But there came after the dark ages a reformation. Light was coming again. Martin Luther was called to worms. He thought to debate what his thesis was all about. But instead, he was brought down before rulers and urged and commanded to recant. Luther asked for time. Went into a room. This bright man went into a room I read all by himself and prayed to God. He said, I'm but a child, not knowing how to go out and come in. Before John Eck, he was a consummate terror. But before God, I'm just a child. When he came back out and Charles V asked him if he would recant, he said, it is dangerous to go against conscience. I cannot, I will not recant. Lord, have mercy on me. Here I stand. He went home without attendance, but Duke Frederick of Saxony kidnapped him, took him to one of his palaces. And when Luther understood that he was free, he not only wrote a mighty fortress is our God, but he began to write the word of God from the Latin to the German. And when he got it ready, another German by the name of Gutenberg had a printing press ready and the word is now being scattered everywhere. The lights have come on again after the dark ages all over the world. There are things that I wanted to tell you and I am bound by the tyranny of the clock. <laughs> but people's minds were darkened. There were folk who killed in the name of God and thought they were doing God's service. There were people who had no understanding of truth and what true prophets had already said. But then almost immediately, God pointed these who now have light to the three angels' messages. The first one uh, of them was that you must fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him. What do you mean worship him? You've been worshiping a man sitting on a throne calling himself God. But now that you're free and the word has returned, worship him. Amen. Well, who is him? He that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. And the Protestant Reformation came to a screeching halt. 
and they began to divide themselves according to creeds. So the second angel went and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. You ever wonder why it said twice? I read one suggestion. It referred not only to the beast, but the false prophets. Not only to them, but to Protestants who did not protest. And finally, out of that, God saw a group which he calls the remnant. The dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with the remnant. The remnant means those who remain, the last ones. The devil has declared war on these, the remnant. That was a great disappointment in 1844. Don't have time to develop it, you know it. But that wasn't the first nor the last. The greatest disappointment of all was when the Lord was hanged on a cross and the church, thinking he was the deliverer, beheld their God dying under curse. That was a greater disappointment. But now here comes one. I understand there were up to 500,000 believers in the advent of Christ, not Seventh-day Adventists, advent of Christ, 500,000. After October 22, 1844, they were quickly scaled down to about 5,000. And in various little knots, they met and they prayed, sometimes all night long. And finally, they expressed to God their everlasting confidence in Him. You are the truth. We made a mistake, not you. And all we want you to do is reveal to us what we should do, and we are willing to do it. Anything. And I can imagine God saying, anything? Yes, Lord, anything. Will you keep my commandments instead of man's? Yes, Lord. If I show you further truth, will you do that? Yes, Lord. I believe they were willing to do anything. Anything. Now, there's something I hope you've caught, but maybe you haven't. During all this period, true prophets showed up to help God's true believers. And where people are committed to full obedience to God, he sends a prophet. And so, as they prayed for light, God called a young woman. Her name was Ellen Harmon. She was reluctant to do this, and I don't blame her, because she understood somewhat what it meant. She never called herself a prophet. She called herself a messenger of the Lord. She had been tested by doctors like Daniel sometimes without air, without breath coming from her body. God chose her, and God used her. And as soon as this happened, along came the counterfeits. And I will not take time to go into all of that. But people were coming, claiming to be true prophets of God. But the one God had chosen, he knew, and he gave special wisdom to. And that one became co-founder of this church. And that one guided this church into its health program, hospitals around the world, its educational program, a chain of universities, colleges, academies, and grade schools around the face of the earth, family life. God made it clear that pornography, even masturbation, is out of harmony with his will. He told her and she told the church, publishing houses, temperance work, everywhere. Her writings edify, keep the church on focus, on point. God chose well when he chose this woman to be his servant. And God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. When our church at my home made a decision that they would save my mother from Sabbath keeping, a committee was chosen, they came. And mother wouldn't argue, but she'd ask questions and confounded the committee. And when they went back, the head deacon turned and handed her a package. He said, I think you'll like this. And when he handed it to her, she gave me scissors. I cut it open, and inside was the great controversy by Ellen White. We had never heard of Seventh-day Adventists. We had no books. We had no teachers, nothing. 
and the Methodist deacon brought us the great consequences. Now, I, I want to read the last paragraph, and it is one of the most comforting things I have ever read. It says, the great controversy is ended. Amen. Amen. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realm of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their overshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. 